It's language that makes the world go round. And in the spirit of today's conference, daring greatly along with that oftentimes comes failing miserably. As in my junior declamation, 28 years ago. He took two ends of this hose like material and somehow fused them together, thereby creating a circle. Did we ever escape high school? What I wanted to say that day, the topics were very serious. Terrorism, teenage suicide. But my topic was about the hula hoop and how Richard Nur had, had riveted the entire nation with his silly invention. He made millions of dollars. And, and he wasn't a one-hit wonder. He actually then introduced the Pluto platter, which when he renamed it the Frisbee, that too took off. And he had a, actually had a hat trick. He had a third success with the venerable Super Bowl. Now, I assure you, most would not have invested in his whammo company uh, out of the gates. It was too ridiculous. Now, the term hoop actually spawns from Holyoke, Massachusetts, Officer William F. Herbert, himself a character. And I like to tell people that I think in his 35-year career, he made one arrest. Uh, <clears throat> he preferred instead to take adult young men and women under his wing, more like a coach. He was more apt to, to counsel them than to incarcerate them. Now, there's many terms to pothead, and what spawned the term hoop? Actually, with, Billy was with his cronies in a gas station where he liked to hang around, likely eating donuts, and he witnessed that, this was in the 50s, he witnessed a, a, a young man drive in in his black van and strewn all around his van were hundreds of pots and pans on the outside, to which Billy quipped, this hoops all pots and pans. And the term stuck, <clears throat> much like the term Hoosier, if you will, in, in the Midwest, the, the term spread around the city colloquially, and then it spread to Boston. Ultimately, it infiltrated into New England. And Johnny Carson was heard to have said the term hoop on his Tonight Show, much to the delight of Holyokers. A nice example of it, <clears throat> again, Billy at his favorite uh, haunt at the gas station, uh, Joey Weiss's grandfather would pull in to get gas in the 60s. And as he'd fill up, he had big tubes of water. He was obsessed with water filtration. And of course, Billy and the guys would run over to the spigot on the gas station, turn it on, and make fun of him. And they'd say, Weiss, water's free. <clears throat> yeah. 40 years later, uh, his grandson is a multimillionaire because he bottled water. Now, hoops are really um, uh, off the beaten path uh, to include collecting toenails, which would seem rather bizarre to most of us, but to a hoop, it's, it's just common form. Um, it's, it's particularly interesting because the collection can never grow. As you add to it, the others decompose. Other examples of hoops are, are dissimilar from Rube Goldberg. Goldberg took simple concepts and made them complicated. Hoops actually do the reverse, as in this example. Gentleman needed to get up to his treehouse. Why not a bicycle elevator? <laughs> hoops constantly beat to their own path. Oops, I'm afraid. Um, and this, this example, a young lady walking her fish. Crazy to us. But then a guy in New York doing the same thing. Let me show you my life. Now, hoops are unlikely to collect silver or gold coin, Bitcoin. Instead, <clears throat> the one core component to a hoop I got this one on a beach in Bali. is they're constantly Best using things that would otherwise be waste to us. In this example, um, the bum actually is telling his life history using pebbles. This is Harry Harrison. Never heard of him. He's a, uh, uh, he owns the uh, Cherry Bee Cab Company in Chicago. He's influenced thousands of people in his career, 40 years driving cab. And there's something magical about his gap tooth grin when he picks you up. He's a former hippie. He'll say, hi, friend. So hoops don't hurt people. They are extremely kind. And he's made a living. If you ask him to pick you up at midnight or 6 a.m., he tells you, I'll do my best. But he's never once missed. And, and Harry, the interesting thing is he doesn't have to pick up strangers. He works off of his own book. He's a hoop. 
beats to his own drum, marches to his own tune. Too many notes. There are just as many notes, Majesty, as are required, neither more nor less. <laughs> Imagine telling Mozart in, in his heyday that he used too many notes. He too was a hoop. Most hoops aren't famous, but then again, some go on to fame. As in the case of Dave Brubeck, when he first played Carnegie Hall in the 50s, the critics were in an outcry because he was offbeat. Imagine telling Dave Brubeck that his polyrhythms didn't work. He couldn't keep time. He went on to, of course, be one of the finest jazz musicians we've ever, we've ever witnessed. Other examples, it cuts across a, a wide spectrum. Uh, Bernicelli, you've never heard of him. You've probably heard of Gilberti in the Renaissance period for carving the famous doors that took him 50 years. And Michelangelo called him the gateway to paradise. Meanwhile, this hoop, he was considered to be a, a buffoon and a babbler. But they couldn't solve how to put a dome or a cupola on the churches that, that they were investing all this money and time into. And of course, along comes a hoop like Bersinelli, and he solves it to boot. Without any engineering degree, he, he also devised the pulley system to get the, the block and the bricks north of, of his nesting within a nesting. That's the concept he invented. Modern day, Anita Roddick, <clears throat> she too is a hoop. Um, she created the body shop, uh, a billion dollar business. But you'd be more apt to find her at a nudist colony than you actually would in a boardroom. Or you'd find her in the streets of Philadelphia where she spent a month before she donated money to the homeless and heroin addicts. She wanted to investigate herself by going homeless and living in the streets for a month. In my own home, my son Max, he's proud to write his name. He can do the M, the A and the X. But when it comes to the W, he has his own spatial way of doing it. He rotates the page and he makes another M. <laughs> Thank goodness. His Montessori class isn't beating his spatial tactic out of him. They appreciate it. Now, in academia, re academic research is rooted in finding patterns. It's what we're trained to do. As in, this flock of starlings, cutting edge physicists and biologists alike, are trying to figure out how does one, one starling move his wing and it affects the entire flock. They don't have cameras quick enough to actually see, but they suspect it's at the neuron and protein level. And the paradox is that this pattern simultaneously is nonlinear, and it, it's, you know, the, the cluster is chaotic, but there's order to it. Kind of breathtaking if you ever get to witness one. This was in Ireland. In my own research, it was actually Hemingway, um, no shortage of hoopy moments for this gentleman, uh, my team and I detected a hyphenated pattern where in his writing with his hyphenated words, we argued that it, it controlled the pitch and the parataxis. It controlled the entire body of work. But so what? What was the impact? We're not literature people. We're STEM people. So we've actually correlated it to an algorithm that can, we think, a method for detecting innovativeness and innovation. And then locally here at our great university, there's a pattern that's not often um, exposed or talk about because, again, we're such a powerhouse in STEM and the sciences. But semester after semester, the most popular course, the, the three top courses are wine appreciation, second, human sexuality, and third, the history of music. That's right, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> <clears throat> now, are we paying attention to these patterns? Are we listening to our students? So. We came up with an interesting way to get across many points. We'll do this in our critical thinking class. We'll do this in project management. We've even done it in Tech 120. And the pineapple challenge, although sticky, has also been um, run um, with CEOs and at workshops at Subaru. Now, the trick to cutting a pineapple, and you typically depends on the lesson and what we're trying to extract from the exercise, but first, you have to be able to pick which one's going to be the sweetest. Not as easy as you think. There are tactics. These are samples through the years. Then the other, the other challenge is the least amount of cuts. How can you be as efficient? So there's prototyping and iter iteration involved. And this one actually was, I think, about 300 cuts, where you could actually take a nice wedge of the tasty pineapple 
and enjoy it, but they didn't win because they weren't as efficient as, as they could be. The lesson also goes for sanitation. It teaches safety. It teaches Kaizen principles. And then, of course, some guys like to hack. Others like to get creative. Pineapple Pinocchio. And then Pineapple Peter. The uh, <coughs> must have been a freshman course. Uh, sometimes they even become elegant. And for the entrepreneur classes, uh, we oftentimes don't provide them with cutlery because an entrepreneur has to figure out how to cut it with your shoelaces or use something in the room. That's how it is to start a business. This is the proper way. Really, four cuts, though the knife wasn't big enough. Incidentally, uh, less than 80% uh, uh, 80, 80 of the people that we've polled have never cut a pineapple. But the nice part here is once you take the core out, you have your four boats. You can then use the crown. Notice the crown was taken off so there was a flat surface. Helps if you have some toothpicks aside. And voila, the perfect, the perfect presentation for pineapple. And oddly enough, <clears throat> this, this method didn't come from anyone in academia. It came from my mom, uh, <laughs> a homemaker. And she's not Hawaiian. But leave it to the researchers, because the element of a hoop always comes back to the, to the refuse, to being resourcefully resourceful. And actually, in Brazil, some researchers are taking the skin of the pineapple and putting it through a machine. And it turns out it creates a bumper four times the resiliency and strength of polystyrene. And typically, the hoop would be the one that would use the skin. They, you know, most of our class, they, they get the point. They walk away 10 years down the road. They've enjoyed the pineapple metaphor. Um, but the hoop always is looking for the, the, the remnants. And the poets, of course, have always known this. You know, the two cultures divide that we have with the, the sciences and the humanities is unfortunate. I think that we have to pay attention to these, these soft skills. They matter. Hence this quote that I tend to agree with. Um, maybe some of you will as well. Now, even in the archives and the spectrum of hoops, uh, Darwin, you probably didn't, didn't know, uh, they don't talk about it, but during his adolescent years, he was prone to daydreaming. Um, his, his parents, you know, thought he was a, just, just an outright daydreamer. Pasteur, his parents thought he was addled. They thought he was woefully confused. They changed their mind when he invented pasteurization. Einstein flunked math, if you can imagine. So his, er, his early career wasn't looking promising. And, of course, one of our own, Amelia Earhart, could find her sledding to outspeed the men. She was known for her belly slamming. That's how it's actually described long before her pilot career. So I think that instead of being elitist in, in, in our academic rigor, which I appreciate on the one hand, I think we have to pay, pay attention to what's worthwhile to our students. And sometimes these silly little exercises and these off-the-beaten-path hoopy components matter. And because at the end of the day, what we're all really trying to do, hoops included, and, and hoops may do this naturally. They don't do things for design or effect. It's just who they are. Um, but <clears throat> it was Schopenhauer, uh, the, the famous German philosopher, who said that at the end, we're trying to get to truth. And to describe truth, he said it goes through three stages. First, and it helps to think about the greats when you're going through this in your mind or reading it out loud. First, he said, <clears throat> truth the first stage, it's, it's uh, widely ridiculed. Secondly, he says, um, it's vehemently opposed, oftentimes death. We wonder if, if these hooligans or hoops um, will, will, will have to go through that. We hope not so cathartic in their experience. But ultimately, and finally, the third stage of truth, it's accepted as being widely self-evident but it takes years and, and iterations. Now, Jessica McIntosh, a dear family friend, was born with severe dyslexia. And her parents worried that, that she wouldn't even get out of elementary school, let alone high school. Jessica has been hula hooping since about age three. And well into her high school career, I'm proud to report in two months, she'll be a, a newly minted college graduate. 
And along her journey, because of her parents' uh, patience and support, this little silly, silly gizmo, the hula hoop, has been her centering grace. She's even earned uh, scholarships because of her hula hooping talent. She's performed at many halftime shows. Uh, you see her here on her, on her summer abroad trip, uh, hula hooping with a fiber optic uh, hoop in Malaysia. And of course now she can wear a pothead while hula hooping and cut the perfect pineapple. And so the point to remember um, is to hope for hoops because they may surprise us. And I suspect that we, this is not the last we'll hear or see of Jessica because I think she'll probably break the Guinness World Book of Records for hula hooping 29 miles. I mean, it's only a marathon plus a few. <laughs> and in the end, no matter your mode of communication, wherever your safe part is, your silly skill, thumb cracking, toenail collecting, hula hooping, it's language that makes the world go round. Thank you.